Hello, my name is Michael Hornsby, and today in this screencast, I'll be discussing how a minority language can be revitalized um, through the schools, through education, by new speakers, um, particularly aimed at new speakers. So first of all, we'll look at language loss in the 21st century as the background to the case study. And then we'll go on to look at the concepts of language maintenance and language revitalization and how some revitalization movements uh, concentrate on uh, revitalizing the language through the school. We'll focus in on the case of the revitalization of Lower Sorbian in Lower Lusatia, Germany, and examine some aspects of authenticity, legitimacy, and ownership, and then I'll draw some conclusions towards the end. So it is known that uh, many languages, many minority languages, are under extreme pressure in the 21st century um, due to various factors, including globalization and the lack of intergenerational transmission. So um, how do minority languages actually maintain the number of speakers and the domains of use? So language maintenance we understand as the process by which languages continue to be spoken by a speech community despite facing competition from dominant or global languages. And strategies which some minority groups use include ensuring it is transmitted to the next generation, ensure that education is provided in the minority language to native speaking children, ensure the language is protected by laws, for example the right to use the language in the public domain, the use of the minority language in media, literature, etc. Employment using the minority language. And finally, overall, generating respect for the minority in wider society amongst the majority population. The first point I mentioned in the last slide uh, concentrated on the transmission of a minority language to the next generation. But here we can see the transmission of minority languages is actually falling. It's not that minority languages are not being transmitted at the same rate as they once were. So to take an example from Wales in the area where Welsh is considered to be the most widely spoken in the northwest of Wales in the county of Gwynedd, we find that 90% um, of the the Welsh-speaking population is actually transmitting the language. Now, 90% may sound like a high percentage of transmission, but it is a 10% loss. And over the subsequent um, generations, a 10% loss will add up um, to a serious loss of intergenerational transmission. So, what are the alternatives to uh, language intergenerational transmission of a minority language. Well, a scheme pro um, proposed by Joshua Fishman uh, looked at the acquisition of the language uh, by adults who can act as, a, as language apprentices. He also suggested that um, the creation of a socially integrated population of active speakers is vital for the maintenance and expansion of a minority language under threat. He further said that where there is a reasonable number of people habitually using the language to encourage the informal use of the language amongst people of all age groups and within families. And in areas where oral competence in the language has been achieved in all age groups to encourage literacy in the language. The way that many minority language groups rely on the transmission or the maintenance of the minority language is through the use of the language in compulsory state education. And this is what we'll examine in further slides. So where the above stages have been achieved and consolidated, uh, Fishman suggests the encouragement of the use of the language in the workplace and then the use of the language in local government services and mass media and the use of the language then in higher education and government. 
Entrusting language revitalization to the schools, though, has been seen as problematic. In the case of Irish in Ireland, for example, the national schools were left to um, revitalize the language on their own. And it's been found in a variety of studies that, for example, English medium education is no longer playing the revitalization and language maintenance role it traditionally did. That is the teaching of Irish as a subject within uh, state schools. An alternative to teaching the minority language as a subject in state schools is the use of immersion education. So immersion education has been described as education where at least half of the subject matter in the school setting is taught using the minority language and uh, has been noted uh, by Garcia and others. Uh, this technique is often adopted in order to reverse language shift and bilingual education or immersion education can be viewed as playing a crucial role in the production of new speakers of the minority language. So immersion education can include children from households where one or more family members speak the minority language. It can include children who have grandparents but not parents who speak the minority language and it can have children who speak the majority language at home but the minority language at school. The case study for this particular screencast concentrates on the case of Lower Sorbian in Germany. Uh, Lower Sorbian is a Slavic language which is spoken in the eastern part of Germany in the land of Brandenburg and it is recognized as a minority language in Germany and Sorbs, both lower and upper, have the status of a national minority. Lower Sorbian is in constant competition with Upper Sorbian and it is considered a seriously endangered language. Up to 20,000 people identify as Lower Sorbs and it is estimated that there are about 7,000 people having some knowledge of Lower Sorbian. Unpublished estimates mentioned at most a few hundred Lower Sorbian speakers who mainly belong to the older generation. And there are a few dozen new speakers belonging to the middle and younger generations. Over the course of the 20th century, Lower Sorbian has faced a number of significant challenges. For example, there was a significant language shift occurring in Lower Lusatia between 1935 and 1955, um, which is linked to the industrialization of the area and uh, the obligatory military service, which many people had to undertake. The arrival of German-speaking migrants from the new Polish territories settled, settling in Lusatia changed the linguistic balance of the inhabitants. And before and after World War II, there was anti-Sorbian policy on the part of the authorities. Language maintenance started in the German Democratic Republic when the Sorbian linguistic infrastructure was established in Lusatia. And under the Social Unity Party of Germany, Lower Sorbian could be taught at schools but only as a foreign language. The situation started to change at the end of the 1990s with the Vitae Welcome Programme of Sorbian Language Revitalization Education and no Sorbian native speakers are to be found amongst the younger generations in Lower Lusatia. So after 20 years of the Vitae programme running, it is still difficult to become a new speaker of Lower Sorbian. The main organisation which uh, provides immersion education in uh, Lower Sorbian is called Vitae, meaning welcome. And this was established once it was realised that the situation of Lower Sorbian was critical, given that there were almost no native speakers of Lower Sorbian left amongst the middle and younger generations. So education programmes were established as a result. As a model, the D1 schools in Brittany, the immersion schools in Brittany, um, were visited at the beginning of the 1990s and the idea of transferring the concept of linguistic immersion to Lusatia was born. 
Thus, a revitalization program based on the D1 school model has proved impossible to be implemented in the same form in Lower Lusatia. The VTI project was first established in kindergarten and then in some primary schools, and the rationale behind it was bilingual education that uses the method of full immersion of a child in one language. However, there were problems because in Lower Lusatia there was almost a complete lack of teachers who would be able to speak Lower Sorbian to any extent. So the partial immersion concept appeared. Uh, many parents were reluctant to send their children to such kindergarten, um, particularly to the school where Sorbian, Lower Sorbian, was the language of instruction. So Sorbian groups have been opened in German kindergarten instead with the idea of applying the rule of one person, one language. And in most Lower Sorbian Vitae establishments, the minority language fulfills only a symbolic role as a language of songs and games, but not as a language of everyday conversations. The revitalization movement in Lusatia has been hampered by an apparent discourse of language death, um, which is circulating amongst the uh, the community there. So uh, David Statnik, who is the president of Domovina, another um, Lower Sorbian language organization, stated in the Zeit in 2011, it is a fact that Lower Sorbian will die out. The question is when. Uh, it's been noted that the Vitae project pupils will probably only achieve a partial ability to apply Sorbian, which is additive to the primary language skills of the child or receptive knowledge of the language. So the way um, Vitae has tried to work around this discourse is to concentrate on the idea of multilingualism. And in one of their pamphlets, they ask, would you like your child to be fluent in the future in several languages. Then give them the chance to start learning different languages as early as possible. There are daycare centres in Lusatia where children can learn a second language even in their daycare or kindergarten age Sorbian. So we should note that the language is actually mentioned right at the end and is not um, emphasised at the beginning. Multilingual, multilingualism is, is um, emphasised and not the actual language in question. The Vitae program aims to create new speakers of Lower Sorbian and we can note that new speakers is a term which refers to regular users of a language but who were not raised with that language as the primary language of socialization in their early years and very often such speakers are unexpected speakers in a minority language situation. Of particular note is uh, the language proficiency of new speakers. Um, some new speakers can reach a very high level of accomplishment and can pass uh, as native speakers, but other new speakers tend to have uh, fewer skills in the minority language. And so there is a continuum of um, speaking ability very often, which is, can be found amongst uh, new speakers. This can also be found, of course, amongst native speakers, because, as uh, Granwald and Berg have noted, amongst native speakers, we can find people who uh, have been called rememberers, latent speakers, passive speakers, or semi-speakers. So there exists uh, a similar range of competence and uh, productive proficiency. One question which is often asked in language revitalization settings is what does it mean to speak authentically? So if you are a native or a new speaker of a minority language, how can you be classed as a legitimate speaker who speaks the language authentically? So now let's turn to what uh, community members of the lower Sorbian speech community actually say. Some of them have said, for example, they want to preserve the language in its beautiful form and they want to take care of the state of the language and that people should speak it really well. 
rather than speaking it um, less well than others. And this seems to create a, a divide in the uh, community. Uh, at least one commentator has said that the language, the Lower Sorbian language, has been standardized badly. And this has repercussions for the particularly the new speakers, since they would have been taught the standard language. The standard language is also seen as something which is artificial. So Lower Sorbian, New Lower Sorbian, can be seen as um, a new language, a neo-language, which has little relation to what was once spoken in the particular area. It is a sort, as it says here, it is a sort of language that is dependent on German because most new speakers are German native speakers. There is the influence of German in the current Lower Sorbian language. Some commentators talked about um, how having a grasp of a particular dialect or showing dialectal features in their speech is an important way of being authentic, of being a uh, legitimate speaker. So this commentator here um, was talking about how they noticed a different pronunciation for uh, the word person. The standard language is sometimes viewed as a simplified language and that people actually want this. They, people want a simplified Sorbian, a simple Sorbian. Of course, any language to be taught needs to be uh, made into a teachable form. Uh, but I think the claim here is based on the fact that um, some new speakers of Lower Sorbian remain with this um, simplified, this teachable form of the language and then do not move on to a more uh, competent use of it. Amongst the people that were interviewed um, for a project that this um, screencast is based on, the, they noted that there were a number of outside influences in the Lower Sorbian language so which is spoken today. Influences from German, or in some cases from Polish, because uh, it has been a certain interest amongst Polish native speakers in learning uh, Lower Sorbian. The leap from being a Polish speaker to a Lower Sorbian speaker is not a great one, so it's um, a fairly easy task for Polish people to do. Um, from the Polish perspective, when we interviewed in our project um, Polish new speakers of Lower Sorbian, they attributed authenticity to the native speakers who only speak Sorbian all the time. So, by way of a conclusion, we can note that it is unclear how a model of intergenerational transmission can be adapted or partially copied when intergenerational transmission is happening less and less in a family set setting, as in the case of Lower Sorbian. Transferring the responsibility of transmission to other agents, such as schools, can fail to take sufficiently uh, well into account the new circumstances in which the language is being learned. This failure to take into account these new circumstances and to think through the final outcomes of immersion education um, are not established very often um, at the beginning amongst uh, language revitalizers. The resulting diversity of speaker profile uh, which emerge from immersion and bilingual settings, as natural a result as this is, given the lack of prior ideological clarification from the outset, can be contested by different commentators, both within and outside the language speaker community. Consequently, different interpretations of success and failure can be applied by different stakeholders to this diversity, rather than any internal measures of success by the educational bodies themselves, or indeed by young speakers of Lower Sorbian in these settings, who may view their educational and linguistic achievements in terms which are considerably different from failure or success. So thank you very much for listening.